Welcome back to our channel. Today we will continue the story of the meeting between Buddha. You might get your papa place contemplate for a moment. Can you see that the existence of this Eve is a result of the intuition clean in your perception? I understand, and I will continue to refine this understanding. As twilight descended, Venerable Sariputta invited monks to spend the night in his retreat for the first time. However, he was aware that these monks followed different disciplines. The monks declined the invitation, expressing concerns about safety. Stay at control and following their recent incident at the Web State. Concerned for their well-being, the monks chose to conduct their rituals outside, which would be safer. Venerable Sariputta recalled his experiences in the distant wilderness where wild animals never harmed him. Even meditating in seclusion on Miss Snakes would pass by without causing any harm. He knew that as long as he didn't disturb these creatures, they rarely posed a threat. Sariputta saw the monk hesitation and said, If you genuinely wish to stay in the retreat, it is certainly possible. You can spend the night there without any issues. The monks accepted his assurance and later they didn't then they entered the retreat. In the sentry part of the retreat a large pile of candles and incense wood was burning. In nearby was a stack of sandal wood to be used for outdoor rituals. Venerable Sariputta believed that the enormous snake might be hidden within the wood pile. As a precaution he chose to sit on the opposite side using his folded robe as a seat cover. Hours passed as he meditated into the night, the dome light streaming through the window. The thought of offering worship under such a beautiful light filled him with joy. He reeled and shook off the dust from his robe, put it on and stepped outside the retreat. In the clear, radiant moonlight, he was ready to perform his worship. He believed it would be a delightful experience. He stood outside in solitude as the moon illuminated the serene environment. And at the twilight hour, the retreat suddenly caught fire. People immediately rushed for help, attempting to extinguish the fiends. Despite their efforts to fetch water from the river, the fire grew more intense, spiraling out of control. Nearly a hundred people could only watch as the retreat was devoured by the flames. Venerable Saripata was deeply concerned because he believed that the venerable monks would surely perish in the fire. If they had accepted his invitation earlier, in the midst of the gathered people, a venerable monk appeared suddenly illuminated by the distant glow of a fire. Without hesitation, he had quit. A devotee named Chen Demo rushed forward, grasping the monk's hand and exclaimed, My dear friend, I'm deeply grateful that you are alive. You are truly unharmed. I am overjoyed for your well-being. Those the moment gently patted John down his shoulder. Smile, and as he responded, I appreciate your concern, my dear friend. There is no need to worry. The venerable monk was aware that later that evening, Yukabertana Sumomone with over 500 disciples in attendance would take a place. He realized that his presence might cause Gendama some distress, so he decided to visit the nearby village of Tikiki's Milvia. Throughout the afternoon, he stayed close to the village, engaged in conversations and shared meals with the locals. As the sun began to set, Jan Dama approached him once more and inquired by friend John Dama, along with others. He was looking forward to having you join us for the evening meal. You did choose not to dine with us. The monk with a soft smile, Jan K shook his head and replied to go on this ceremony. I did not wish to be present physically. Jindamo pressed further, why would you not want to participate in our ceremony? The monk chuckled softly and shook his head once more. No, my dear friend, it is not that I shun the ceremony. It's just one of the many narrow viewpoints held by people. It's similar to the misconception of a permanent self. This view which implies a permanent self is a fundamental misapprehension. Jindamo continued to ponder, have you ever deeply observed your own body, sensations, thoughts, consciousness, and mind? They're all interconnected just like the flowing elements of a river constantly changing. Nothing is inherently independent or everlasting, woman nodded in agreement. Indeed, everything is interconnected and nothing possesses inherent independent existence. In life and death are intertwined and the birth of one leads to the birth of another. It's the universal law of dependent origination that governs our existence. 
Without a cause there is no effect and without conditions nothing can arise. I have realized this truth through meditation. Deep in thought John Damo acknowledged you have indeed contemplated the profound teachings of interdependence. Now let us return to the assembly. Together they made their way back to the monastic community where John Damo was deeply touched by the reverence shown by the mixed disciples. Every morning Jen Dunmo provided food offerings to the venerable monk to ensure he did not have to beg for alms. After their midday meal, the monk often strolled through the woods or sat by the lotus pond engaging in profound dialogues, with Chen Dunmo developing a deeper understanding of his sincerity. The passage conveys a profound message about Buddhism and its principles. Here's good content suitable for a Buddhism book. By the twilight of a day that extended into dawn the dinks of the Nyanjara, where it were witnessed the sudden rise of tumultuous waters, doomed to a devastating flood. The surrounding fields and hums were engulfed by the raging torrents, leaving only a few boats as a means of salvation. Though the disciples of the venerable teacher could seek refuge on higher ground, but were unable to find the revered Jatish for spiritual guide. Desperate to locate him, they set out in small boats, and eventually they discovered him high in a distant mountains. Oh, miraculously, the flood water subsided as quickly as they had surged. The following morning, the teacher descended the mountain and heading to the villagers to assess the situation and understand how the local residents had been affected. Fortune smiled upon them as no lives were lost in the flood due in part to the modest possessions of the villagers. Nonetheless, the teacher's disciples began the challenging task of rebuilding the sacred fire shrine which had been destroyed by the friar from above and the houses that had succumbed to the deluge. As the teacher, on afternoon his disciple Jatish stood by the banks of the Nirangara river, the teacher asked, You had advised me to observe a person's body sensations, thoughts, actions, and consciousness to understand the quality of that life. I have embarked on this contemplative journey, and I've come to realize that the interplay of these five aggregates lacks constancy. I've also grasped that the concept of an independent self is illusory. Chiodish agreed and continued, This teacher I can carry its suffering is an integral part of existence, and it arises too to various causes. When these causes are eliminated, suffering ceases as well. My understanding is they and to remove the causes of suffering, they must gain insight into the true nature of reality. The teacher nodded in affirmation and added, You are correct to identify the nature of suffering and its origins. Eliminating these causes is the path to liberation. However, one cannot merely internalize this understanding. It requires a deep experiential insight. Jyotish then asked them, if a person desires to cross the river but lacks the means, what should they do? If the waters are shallow, they can simply walk across. If they are deep, they must swim or find a boat. But what about those who never know how to swim or have access to a boat? The teacher pointed to the opposite bank and replied, In that case, they hope for a benevolent being on the other side to come to their rescue. What are your thoughts on such an individual? Chotish responded enthusiastically. I would say that person is exceedingly fortunate. <laughs> the teacher smiled and said, Indeed, that is the case, Chotish. A person does not illuminate the ignorance and delusions about the world. They were lean stuck on the shores of suffering, unable to cross to the other side of liberation. Such an individual is bound by attachments and desires a captive of their own making. At this Jyotish suddenly broke into tears prostrating himself before the teacher. He cried, Teacher, I have wasted half my life. Please accept me as your disciple and grant me the opportunity to learn and attain liberation alongside you. This adaptive passage explores the open in such suffering and the path to liberation offering valuable insights to the end, seeking the deeper understanding of Buddhism and its teachings. The Buddhist monk extended his hand to comfort his disciple and said, I will never hesitate to accept you as my pupil. But how you handle the 500 followers when I'm gone? Who will guide them in your absence? The disciple with a calm demeanor replied tomorrow morning, 
I will address them. In the afternoon, he will reveal my decision. The monk, somewhat surprised, inquired the villagers often referred to me as Nabuta. What? How do you feel about it? The disciple responded, I will also address you as such. Reflects the intention of the observer, doesn't it? On the following day, the monk entered into the village park, taking in a meal with the villagers. After which he set out towards the lotus pond, ere his disciple approached him with a request, my fellow brethren wish to pledge their commitment to you as their teacher. The second day, the monk and his disciple gathered out all the brethren, and most disciples and offering their head for they affirmed their allegiance to the Dharma and the understanding of the path to enlightenment. After three recitations, they chanted, We take refuge in the Buddha, we take refuge in the Dharma, and we take refuge in the Sangha. Their voices resonated through the serene forest. With the ritual complete, the monks started to share the fundamentals of the path to enlightenment, discussing how to observe their own breath, body, and thoughts. He also instructed them on mindful eating and the liberation of animals previously raised for sacrifice. In the afternoon of that day, the monk and his disciple met with the leaders of the brethren. They discussed the best way to organize the monastic community. The disciple, known for his leadership abilities, was assigned the role of guiding the younger novices while the monk took charge of the more experienced disciples. The following day, the younger brethren approached the disciple, declaring they wished to be his disciples. The two brothers, who had always been affectionate and mutually devoted, agreed to share the responsibilities of being the monk's spiritual sons. This unity allowed them to become spiritual siblings and devoted disciples of the monk. One day, after a period of contemplation, the monk called all the brethren at the mountaintop. He declared all sensory experiences, he ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind are burning, whether with pleasant or unpleasant sensations. They burn with desires, aversions, and delusions. They also burn with birth, aging, on us, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. He continued, sensations are burning, whether they are sweet or bitter. This burning arises from sensory organs that are objects in the consciousness that connects them. This burning is caused by craving, ignorance, and attachment. All sensory experiences are on fire not only in the physical realm, that only mental domain as well, the monk emphasized. A realization dawned upon the brethren that every sensation, regardless of being pleasurable or painful, was burning with desire, aversion, ignorance, and attachment. It was through this understanding that they could transcend a cycle of suffering and attain true liberation. Do not let the fires of greed, aversion, and delusion consume you. Clearly understand the universality and interdependence of all phenomena. Avoid becoming slaves in the colossal wheel of birth or death formed by sensory organs, their objects, and sensory consciousness. All of the brethren with deep listening and focused minds were profoundly moved. Each one found a path to see through the true nature of reality, achieving liberation with unwavering faith residing in their hearts. The monk remained in the Lotus Pond village for three months guiding a brethren. They all made significant progress during this time. From then on, the disciple Nadis Ananda became a valuable assistant to the monk, shouldering many of the teaching responsibilities. In the tapestry of Buddhist lore, the meeting between the Buddha and Mahapasi at the marks, not just a historical moment, but a cosmic convergence of souls all shared quest for enlightenment. As we conclude this chapter of their journey, yet let's carry forward the lessons of entering Panman Man Tritness and the transformative power of understanding the fundamental elements of existence. The Buddha's wisdom shared with Mahakasyapa echoes through the ages inviting us to contemplate the interconnected nature of all things and the paths that led us toward liberation. Until the next exploration into the realms of ancient wisdom, may the light of understanding guide your spiritual journey.